hey everybody welcome to the board game mechanics for late september oh no wait yeah late september our last show in september uh so not quite october yet jason nope not yet oh s- spoilers there's jason <laughs> yeah. uh, hey, i'm guys. joel and with me is uh jason hey what's going on so man we broke the canon of our intros i don't know what's gonna happen yeah it's okay pretty pretty weird <laughs> <laughs> So, hey, real quick, I'm just going to apologize to everybody involved. Uh, one, that I think my audio up to this point has probably been a little crackly, so I'm turning that down a bit. But I think, uh, I, man, we recorded a real just great episode, just the best episode that you know, you'd know you ever want to hear. And then it exported 50, cents, 50 seconds of my audio, 50 cents worth of my audio, too. <laughs> yeah. But 50 seconds of my audio got exported. And uh, I, I ran a recovery utility, so I, oh man, the process on this, I found a file recovery utility, recovered all the files, they're all six seconds a piece, then I found a, a name, a, a file renaming convention machine that renamed all the files so they're in sequential order, then I found an Audacity repair tool that takes those six second clips of audio and puts them back together. Wow. And all that to say I got back like maybe half my audio. So, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> anyway, uh, if you really want to know like the rough cut of what we're actually doing this week, then I can send that to you. But I, I assure you there's no reason to have that at all whatsoever. <laughs> so uh, that was totally my bad. Jason is the very good boy. He never, ever messes up on his episodes. <laughs> I always do. So that's what happened. Uh, big apologies, though, to uh, you guys out there. And I hope that, you know, Jason, sleight of hand, magic of editing, uh, put together some of our uh, live video audio, live audio of our, our audio from our live video to kind of give you guys a little bit of a top five, but not really top five, like intermediate five. Yeah. Um, which reminds us we need to do the top five at some point. <laughs> yeah, that's true. We do. <laughs> so, yeah. And, and uh, I guess... In the zany banter section, this is where Jason lets me have fun. So I uh, tonight was out at at a Goodwill because I collect CDs. I mean, why wouldn't I? I do a podcast about board games. Why wouldn't I collect CDs of all things to do? <laughs> well, so yeah. yeah. I, was, I, I was looking for CDs at the Goodwill store, and this lady comes up to me, and she goes, she's holding this big calculator, and she goes, is this an adding machine that takes spools of paper? And I go, um... Yeah, 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 I think so. And the lady just seemed like she might have been an accountant, I, for all I know. But, like, she was so excited for this spool of paper. And she was probably as excited to get a spool of paper as I would be to get my copy of Dinosaur Island from Kickstarter. So uh, just always, always fun things happening at the uh, Goodwill store. But... I went there to, you know, I mean, from what I see on Facebook, most people, when they go to Goodwill, there's like, I don't know, seven copies of Zombicide and like eight copies of Settlers of Catan and like, um, I don't know, a bunch of copies of Predator Porter and stuff like that. So, um, yeah, I don't think that's actually true, but that's what they say on Facebook. Yeah. I need one of those Goodwills for sure. They don't exist. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure. Well, it's funny that you brought up uh, the the mailman bringing things because I have a little story I wanted to talk about a mailman. Yeah, while we're in here, yeah. Uh, so I get review games. You get review games. So the mailman's starting to see a trend that I'm getting games with the title with the address to somebody named Board Game Mechanic. So he he asked Katie one day, hey, what's all this Board Game Mechanic stuff about? So she introduces him, you know, tells him about the podcast, and he says, so check it out. And <laughs> I just think it's funny that you know you've made the dozens and dozens of listeners when your mailman recognizes that you have a board game problem and ask about your podcast. <laughs> well, you are a review machine, and... <laughs> You are just doing a lot of reviews out there. Jason is the boy who doesn't say no to doing a review. Nope. It feels like. So Some of them. If, you, if you've got a box of rocks and a couple of cardboard squares that you want Jason to review, he, uh, he probably wouldn't do it. But he might. I don't know. Yeah. If the gameplay is heavy enough. <laughs> as long as I don't have to send it to another reviewer. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's a, that's a rough trend. Yeah. Not a fan of those. 
Well, and then there's a kind of paradoxical nature to your reviews, too, because you can be a real nasty man or you can be a real good boy when it comes to those reviews based on uh, how much cursing you want to have in the company's <laughs> name. Yeah, that is true. I, I'm doing a little cursing in this next one, so we'll see. Yeah, <laughs> cheap, cheapest games. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah, that's funny. All right, so jumping into the news, we have a few games on Kickstarter that I think are interesting, and I'm going to start with the one that I'm most excited about, and that is the first big expansion for Merlin called Arthur. So this adds a new rondelle. It basically substitutes out the t- the current table layout that's on the board now and puts a new one on there, and it adds Merlin, or not Merlin, um, Arthur, who can functions kind of like Merlin, but he can move around the board both ways. And it gives you a different player board because there's new people that you're trying to fight off and collect. And it just looks like it makes the game go from crunchy to even more crunchy. So I'm in all the way. I backed this as soon as I saw it. And Merlin, expansion, Arthur, super pumped. Very cool. And since it's on Kickstarter, I assume there's like at least six or eight minis on there? No minis at all. Yeah, it's just, I mean, let's just call it what it is. It's Queen Games pre-order yeah. system. That's fine. I'm supposed to have it by November. That's what it said. <laughs> That's insane. Yeah, it's pretty awesome. There there may, there well, there may be more copies of the expansion than actual Merlin out there. I mean, honestly, I mean, like, I don't know. You don't see that game anywhere. No. It's crazy. I, I think it's kind of hard to find still, so. Yeah, I got yeah. I got mine at Origins, and I haven't ever seen it at a store, ever. Me, me either ever and i've been looking so yeah it's crazy to to you know like go hey jason another one you don't have the only one in america (laughs) but i haven't been able to prove that yet so well next bgm con i'm definitely bringing it and you're gonna have to play it because it is one of my favorite games probably right now really yeah i love it a lot cool i've I've never heard you just like go on about it so i i guess uh i don't know we're gonna have to we're going to have to do a password here, Jason. All right, everybody. The password is hashtag we want a Merlin review. <laughs> yeah, I thought about it. I'm pondering it. We'll see. If we can get enough comments, maybe I'll do it. All right. I'm commenting right now. <laughs> All right. Well, while you comment, I'll talk about some other games. Uh, the next game that I wanted to talk about is called The Stygian Society. This is from designer Kevin Wilson, I believe. And this is uh, like a... Comp- cooperative dungeon crawl that uses a cube tower so each baddie and hero has certain cubes that they're going to throw into the tower to determine the outcome of the battle and at the bottom of the tower there's this little dungeon which is like a little square that's fenced in if cubes bounce into the dungeon they're worth double but if they just come out at the bottom and don't go in the dungeon they're worth single hit points so you want good ones to fall into the dungeon you don't want the bad ones to fall in there and it's just seems like a, a pretty zany game so i figured i'd mention it because that's actually the one dungeon crawl that i'm kind of interested in because it's super (laughs) euro-y and i like that yeah it's like wolfenstein el grande crawler (laughs) yeah it is it's essentially a card game with a cube tower (laughs) sounds cool yep i'm into it uh the next game is a reprint of an old spiel winner called mississippi queen uh, I'm not. I don't remember who's putting this out. I forget. But I didn't know much about this game until I looked it up because it's was out way. Isn't it Fog Hat? I think is. <laughs> I think the band that does Mississippi Queen is Mountain. Oh, oh, not Fog Hat. <laughs> nice try though. <laughs> I didn't know much about this game because it, it came out way before I started playing games. It's like '97 or before that. But essentially, you're like river boats, and you're trying to basically just be the first person to hit the end of the course and maybe pick up some passengers along the way for extra points. And the way that it works is there's two little dials, which are like the the wheels, the paddles or whatever of the boat. And one is for coal and one is for distance you can move. So in order to turn, you have to spin coal. And if you run out of coal, your boat dies. So you're trying to manage your coal spent expenditure and not run into islands. Seems pretty easy. Not really my type of game, but it won the spiel, so people must like it. 
Here is my um, Mississippi Queen story, Jason. Uh, okay, here it is. Uh, I at one point wanted to collect every spiel winning game, um, and I got Scotland Yard, and I got Elfin Land, and I looked up the list of all the other games, and I saw this one, and I thought, oh, this is kind of when board games were becoming modern and kind of taking that familiar shape and. I think this might have been like a Mayfair game even. Maybe, maybe not. I don't know. I might be thinking of the other game that looks like just like this game, but it's not it. But um, I, I remember thinking this is kind of a cool game. It's got like the cool dials on the boats or something. I don't know. And then I saw that it was really expensive. And then I played Elfin Land and I played Scotland Yard and I go, so the Spiel, I guess, really wasn't that hard to win back in the 90s and 80s. And so I didn't ever buy this game. <laughs> or today. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. If you want to back Mississippi Queen, do it. I'm going to pass. I'm passing on all of these. The one that is the most ex- most interesting to me is probably the Merlin expansion, and that's even without me owning Merlin, because Merlin <laughs> does seem pretty awesome. Yeah. Merlin is the best roll and move game ever. When do you think... I mean, you've been following this for a few years now, Jason. Um, probably Kickstarter stuff a little closer than me, honestly. When do you feel like the best Kickstarters come out? Um... I don't know. It's probably the beginning of this year, actually, when like Dino- yeah, I think Dinosaur Island and all of them were on there. I think spring is kind of when Kickstarter season is. Honestly, I think people hold off on their Kickstarters around the, the con seasons. I think because they're like, "Hey, I'd like to make a splash," and people aren't paying attention to Kickstarter when cons are going on. It's just my theory. Yeah, but I, it does feel like seriously February, March, April is when amazing Kickstarters happen, and that's when the ones I backed came out. So, yep, I don't know. Now I just want to get them. That'd be nice. Yeah, no kidding. And like, even when they send you those updates that say, "Hey, sixty days till it's in the United States," then another fifteen till you get it. You just go, <sighs> "Okay, cool." Yeah. <laughs> well, anyway, I somebody did do split shipping at Edison Island. I got to see that. So it looks good. I'm looking forward to my copy coming, but feel jealous for everybody who gets to play that while I wait. Yeah, I actually I was gonna play that last weekend, but I didn't. It's sitting on my shelf, just staring at me right now. Has it held up for you? Is it still one that you love? Oh yeah, it's awesome. I would play it more. It just takes up so much of the table. It's it's not hard. It's just huge. Yeah, well, it's playing four games at once, kinda. Yeah. You know, <laughs> that's true. <laughs> and then you're gonna add that totally liquid expansion on there, and it'll be like you need a second card table, which will be cool. Oh yeah, so. that will be cool. I'm pumped. All right, so I got to play a game I've been super pumped for this last weekend, and it did not disappoint. And the game is Symphony Number no. 9 by Moa Ideas Game Design. I don't know if even though that's how, it, that's if, if that's how you say it, but whatever. Essentially what this is is a stock speculation game and some blind bidding where you're trying to earn reputation of these musicians so you can get composition tiles to perform them in a concert and you're going to do this by taking cubes of their color off this board and then your whoever has the majority of the cubes at the end of each each round is going to get the composition tile so you want to have cubes left over at the end of the round because when you go to the concert based on what level the musician is of the concert that's funded those are the cubes that are going to pay out so you're trying to Get cubes of maybe all the colors or really focus on one color, but then you have to work with all the other players to make sure that you can fund the concert at the level that you want with blind bidding. So you can talk about it, but no one really knows if you're really going to bid what you say you're going to bid. So you could screw somebody over if they have all the big dog musicians, but you have the little peon musicians that don't pay out that well. So you can just contribute one coin just to mess them over. Oh, it's, it's so good. It's, it's fantastic. I can't wait to play it again. I don't think Katie loved it, but me and my buddy Matt, we kind of dug it. So, yeah, I'm ready to play it again. Symphony number nine. So, three thoughts on this. Um, one, there's like this terrible, terrible storm rolling into my area. So, I'm like kind of half paying attention to the weather to see if I need to like save my file and worry about a power outage. Um, I think we'll be okay. But I kind of zoned out for a minute while I did that. And I was like, I see the other game you're going to talk about. And I'm like, 
it's a, it's first on the nuts. I'm like that game sounds so much like Symphony Number no. Nine. Like <laughs> Jason's really on one of these like bidding and speculation <laughs> kicks right now. That's yeah. that's crazy. Like, and then I'm like, wait, that, you, oh, okay, I get it. It just it was one of those dumb brain moments where like my brain had to catch up. It was just yeah, it, it was dumb. So yeah, so I don't know. Yeah. I don't know if you're gonna be able to find this game anybody because it was shipped to me from Taiwan. I don't know if it's in America at all, but if you can find it, I highly recommend it. Like, this is one of my the, my favorite games that I played this year. That's come out this year for sure. That's pretty cool, man. I will uh, look forward to playing that too. I I just man, for you to get this pumped about something, it's got to be great. And I'm gonna tell you, I am in the same boat with something that I played. Um, it's very rarely that I lose sleep over a game, like where I play a game and it haunts me so much that I'm like, oh man, I want to play that again. I want to play it this way instead. And embarrassingly, the first game I remember this, this doing this to me was King of Tokyo. Like I just loved the interaction and how stupid it was and just we had, we're having such a good time playing it that I was like, man, I want to play this the next day. And I'm not sure if I played it since, honestly, because um, I was really disappointed when I played it the next day. But like uh, <laughs> King of New York's better. I agree to disagree. I don't know. I like the simplicity of it. We need to do a game versus game podcast at some point. Um, actually, speaking of that, I did show like the, the Dice Tower Showdown. I don't know if you've ever listened to that, but I was on the episode that was um, King of Tokyo versus King of New York, oh, and that was Team King of Tokyo. That's cool. Um, I was on there with the Metal Meeple. No, 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 no. That wasn't for that one. Uh, the Metal Meeple and I did, uh, I don't even remember now, something else. Uh, I don't know. Rock band manager versus I don't know. Not that's not true, but that was a funny joke. Very good joke about <laughs> the, the metal meeple. Yeah. Um, the game I played was Brass, and it just haunted me, man. I just love this game so much. I get why it got a reprint. I get why there's versions of it that are, that are like spinoffs of it. It's just so good, and I don't even know how to explain why it's so good. It looks terrible. The edition I have, the, I played the first time I played. I played it twice over the weekend. First time I played, I played on the nice brand new Kickstarter edition, and it's really good. I mean, it's got some improvements on the graphic design, and it's got some improvement on the card design and things like that that just do make it better. But then I have the old copy, like the old edition that I got from the guy who bought the new Kickstarter edition. He sold me his old copy real cheap. So I have his old edition, and uh, it doesn't come with the two-player variant. So I had to print off the two-player board and paste it on the back of the original board, which turned out pretty good. But I found this game's not as awesome with two players, but still really good. And I just, honestly, this is a game that I think I would, if if I could, I would get it out right now and play it again. Like, right now, this minute. I mean, I would go to bed late and just be tired the next day kind of game. Like, it's so good. And it's basically all you do is you're just putting down tiles in these cities that you have cards to give you, like, kind of the rights to do it. And just opening coal plants, opening up, you know, iron plants, opening up cotton plants. And the game's called brass but i mean i don't it's weird i guess if you mix iron and cotton you get brass <laughs> but um yeah clearly <laughs> yeah. but it's 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 really good though it's it's really good um it's i understand why it's held in such high regard it's just a masterpiece of design it's so good um i understand the martin wallace genius thing now i mean he's just it's a brilliant game that you have these links that you have to get resources to and build a network but it's just there's so many good meaningful decisions on it but the game isn't heavy i mean i think i don't know people people out there in the world say it's a fairly heavy game i guess it's a martin wallace game but i mean jason you're gonna call it ticket to ride basically i think i mean like it seems kind of light to me lightish to me yeah it it really probably will i mean like it's not it's got super meaningful decisions but the mechanics aren't thick i guess Really, it's kind of like we almost need to have a discussion as the world of board gaming and saying, what makes a game heavy? Is it that there's like convoluted, thick rules and there's lots of things to remember in the rule set? Or is it that you have to make like really meaningful, difficult decisions? And so, like, I don't know. I think this is heavy in that I have to make difficult decisions and there's a lot of options for me, but not heavy in that, like, there's a lot of rules to remember. There's, there's some weird rules, some rules that kind of like are peculiar, but it's not a hard rule set to wrap your head around, but it, there, it just is a good rule set to like set up a framework for making these really just tough, hard decisions that you have to make for, do I want to grow this way or grow this way? Or just, you know, is now the time to ship this or, I mean, just kind of just really cool things that happen in that game. And I, again, speaking of board game mechanic cons, 
I think this is probably the third game on the list that we're going to have to play. We're going to have to have a 20-hour day, man, to get everything built, put in. But this is one that I definitely want to play next time we get together. Yeah, I'm interested in it. I, I actually, this is going to sound crazy, but I actually like the look of the older one better. I don't know. I'm a sucker for the way the old games look. I really like it. But yeah, e- yeah you either way. You like that function over form. I mean, like, and that's the way how the old one, I think, feels a little bit. Um, the new board's a little dark, I think, really. Um, it still, but I guess it the still looks is, amazing, but yeah. You can get a copy of the old version of Brass now for like 10 bucks. So if you like it, you can go find a cheap one. Right. Yeah, I thought about it. I, w- I found one for 20 bucks that I've been eyeing. but I did modify mine. Um, one of the things that... Okay, so there's two things that have happened in the new edition. One is when you flip the tiles over, the tiles look significantly different like they still have your main game color on them but they're like two-toned so you can really see the different colors on them yep um but but the uh the the old edition it's just like basically the numbers are slightly different like the positions of them so i went ahead and got a straight edge and a permanent marker and i like made black lines on the back sides of all my tiles because i thought that was a function thing that was pretty cool and it doesn't really change the look of the game at all and then there's one route that they were like, there was this weird convoluted rule about like you could ship goods one way but not the other to one location. Right. And they took that rule out. And so like I'm just going to play without that rule, I think. So um, anyway, that was brass. Really love it. understand why it's considered a masterpiece and a classic. Well, while we're on Martin Wallace, I'll talk about a Martin Wallace game that I played. And that is London First Edition because, you know, I'm a sucker for the old, old versions. So basically what this game is, it's a card game where you're basically just building an engine. The whole game is about you playing cards to build an engine. And you're doing that to build buildings across the city of London on the map because every building you have built reduces poverty that is generated when you run your engine because your poverty that is generated is the number of cards you have in your engine minus the cities that you have built in London or the boroughs I guess you have built in London. So you're trying to earn a bunch of, mo- of money so you can build the cities. You're trying not to take out loans because like every good Martin Wallace game, you have to have loans that you got to pay back at 50% interest. And yeah, it's it's good. It It's really easy to play a card. You just have to discard a card of the same color in order to put it down in your city. It's super easy, but man, trying to figure out which cards to play in your engine and which cards to spend to play those cards. And if you want to run your city or do you want to make your city bigger yeah tons of decisions good classic martin wallace game probably well my favorite martin wallace game because it's i think it's the only one that i've played so (laughs) yeah that's london first edition yeah i i think brass is my favorite wallace martin wallace game because he's the other one i've played i think i've played is age of steam his game yeah i think so i'm trying to remember i think so Uh, that one's fine um i played via nebula that one's fine, but Brass is really good. And I want to play London. It was funny because I sent you a picture of Brass, I think, and then you sent me back a picture of London. <laughs> like I think we were both playing Lost games like at the same time. Yeah, I think so. And that picture you sent me of London, I was like, oh, this looks like my version of Brass, like your version of London does. So, <laughs> yep. I, I don't know. I, I think uh, I think you're. I'm with you. Like I almost feel nostalgic now for that old GMT look of like square chits with like very peculiar symbology and numbers and specific spots. I don't know. It's kind of cool, I guess. Yeah. Um, it's tree frog. Yeah. I mean, so you get what you get for tree frog, but yeah, I like it. Yeah, for sure. Yep. Uh, I guess I should talk about one more game that I played. I played Western legends. Um, I've played this twice now. Um, at different player accounts. I played once at two players really enjoyed that. Cause it almost feels like a co-op game. Because you're fighting this like AI player kind of thing, um, so that's kind of neat. Because you're kind of playing against the other player, but also playing a little bit co-op almost to try and keep this man in black from like doing too much damage. Got to watch out for Johnny Cash, um, <laughs> always. And and then uh, and then playing with four players, um, it was still really good, and it was really fun to see how people played the game. Like I rustled cattle and got fairly close to winning the game the guy who won the game just panned for gold the whole time and he got a really upgraded mule and we didn't stop him like we should have robbed him a couple times to slow him down but we didn't so he ran away with it um but then the guy who like ended up in last place only ended up in last place because he had a couple bad hands of poker um but he was digging the fact that you could play poker so he was just at the saloon playing poker the whole game and 
Then when he earned enough money, he'd go to the brothel and earn some legend points, and then he'd go back and play more poker. Like, and that's a very legitimate way to play the game. So, I mean, just pretty weird that it's just a bunch of mini games that kind of go together and make a whole like course of a game. Um, kind of neat. I, the components are fine. The the stuff isn't anything to write at home about. But um, Western Legends, I think it's a fun game. I think it's as good of. Uh, Beer and pretzels, and Ameritrash kind of game as you're going to find, um, which is like telling Jason it's as pain-free of an oral surgery as you're going to get. So, I mean, something like that maybe. I don't know because I'm pretty sure that you wouldn't love it, but I think it's pretty great. Yeah, I mean, it does look cool. I- I'm interested in some of the mini games. It just it's too wide open. It needs some restriction for me or I'd, I don't know. I-, I need a little more punishing. I want the game to beat me around a little bit. And then, then I'll like it. I don't remember. I, I was going to say, don't go into Croft Wagon thinking that it's heavy because it's really not. All right. So we said we would answer your questions. So here we go. We're going to answer your questions. We had a post up on Facebook. We had about, I don't know, 15 or so questions. I could count them, but I'm not going to that all you guys submitted that you wanted us to answer. There's some serious ones. There's some not so serious ones. And yeah, so we'll just jump right into it and I'll ask a few and then Joel ask a few and we'll just go back and forth like that. That seems to work the best. All right. That does seem to work the best. Yes, it does. Um, so the first question in a four X game, which X is your favorite and why? X time and eight. Um, no, I think I like, uh, I think I like the, uh, exploit. I like being able to kind of build the engine part of a 4X game, be able to say, hey, I'm using this planet to get this, then I ship it to these guys who do this with it. You know, I mean, I think that's kind of a cool thing in a, in a 4X game. Um, I, I guess I'm thinking more of Race for the Galaxy, which isn't a 4X game, but I mean, like, most 4X games i played are in space, and there's some kind of variant of that, usually, where it's like you're trying to power up this thing to make this thing happen, and I think that's kind of cool. Yeah, I'd probably go with Explore slash Exploit. Probably leaning a little more toward exploit. Because, yeah, like you said, getting resources, trading resources in for things. That's the stuff that I like, and that's really the only X that I like. And I do wonder, why are there no 4X games that aren't in space? There has to be a way you can do that on the ground somehow. There are. There are. I mean, uh, I would say Heroes of Land, Air, and Sea is a 4X game on ground. Um, I mean, there are some. They're just not that many out there um it's weird western western legends is one it's not um <laughs> I, say, I don't think so <laughs> and i think if somebody finds the hidden tapes of of my first time answering that question i think i said explore the first time so i think i perjured myself i do like exploring too because it's always fun to flip stuff over and say oh man what kind of luck am i working with so i don't know I, the, the those two are my favorite like the exterminate stuff man i think both of us are like you know what You keep your corner of the galaxy, I'll keep mine. We'll be happy. It'll be all good. Yep. Agreed. All right. So which game in our current collection do we hope our children will keep after we're gone? I hope that he hangs on to my prototype if it ever gets published. I mean, obviously. Um, Because it actually has a lot to do with my family history. Um, So not only is it a game that I think is cool. Um, but it has to do with like kind of my grandpa's life and stuff like that. So I think it's a way to keep my legacy going, kind of. Um, but uh, aside from that, which is kind of a cheat answer, um, I've got fond memories of us buying a copy of Flick 'Em Up. So like, just thinking it was cool at the time, and it was our first time going to Gen Con as a family, and just kind of I I don't know. I'd like to see that one be hung on to. I'd like to see him hang on to a copy of Ticket to Ride because we played a lot of that when he was younger. So that's that's the stuff that I hope my son hangs on to. I don't know that he will. He kind of is like going through a rebellious teenage stage where he doesn't really play board games with me that much. Although that said, he asked if we wanted to do a DSG video this weekend, which will be the first one in, I don't know, five years. So um, I don't know. I, I think probably Ticket to Ride, pick him up, or my prototype. Yeah, I would say I gave an answer of Dragon's Breath last time in the Lost Tapes, which is probably true because that's the first game that the girls actually remember me playing with them. But... I also think I'd want them to keep Trakirian because I got that with Katie on our 10th anniversary and we went back to the hotel room and played it. So that just is the one, the one of the few games that I have in my collection that we actually got 
you know, when we had some time to ourselves and that, that I can actually remember getting for a purpose. So Trickerian and Dragon's Breath are my games. Yeah, I, I still really want to play Trickerion. So if you want to leave me your copy of Trickerion, that'd be cool. <laughs> All right, sure. If, if I die before you, you can have Trickerion. That's fantastic. <laughs> Uh, all right. What's what, what's the one goal, Jason? You have for this podcast future? Um, I would like to maybe make a little bit of cash to make some of the time that I put into it worth it, and to maybe just be able to go to a con and have a booth and people come up and maybe talk to us. I had some more humble um, visions and the lost tapes, but I've expanded my vision, so that's what I want: money and fame. I'm with you. I at least don't want us to have to spend a ton of money to do this thing, like, which is kind of where we're at with it. I mean, like, I think you spend money to ship giveaways away. I spend money to buy games that I think are going to be that I'm interested in, but I think more so I think people will want to see reviews of. Um, we pay for, you know, hosting and equipment and stuff like that. So it'd be really cool if at some point, a couple years down the road, we could do a Kickstarter and say, hey, listen, all we want is a thousand bucks. So. You can have a bookmark with our faces on it for a dollar. I don't know. Um, <laughs> Everybody wants but, that. <laughs> but I mean, like, seriously, I'd love for us to at least like be able to make this thing. Not, I don't want to make tons of money off it. I just want to make it. It can pay for my hobby. You know what I mean? Like, um, I think it's probably where you're at for the most part. But I mean, like, if we got rich and famous off it, that'd be cool. I'm just going to say it right now. Jason, I'm fine with you being our first full-time employee. You can make that leap first. I'll be cool to follow once we are totally fiscally uh, solvent and we can pay us both six-figure incomes. I'll jump on too. So (laughs) It'll probably pay some hundreds, maybe hundreds of hundreds of dollars. Well, I mean, like, we could do that. I mean, like... We could answer the Dice Tower's emails. I mean, like, that Dice Tower email we got where he's like, oh, dang, you guys figured it out. You perfected it. We just take over the, the whole tower because you guys are the best boys. We want to let you have it. And we're like, Tom, just keep doing it, man. It's cool. Like, yeah, that's so far from the truth because everyone rips off Tom Vassell's <laughs> format when they do reviews. But yeah, true. <laughs> anyway. Yeah, no, uh, uh, whenever we say anything about the Dice Tower, I hope people get we're always very tongue-in-cheek because we respect the heck out of those guys. I mean, for sure. Oh, yeah, I watch the Dice Tower all the time. There's, Yeah, it's it's for sure jokes, yeah. And Tom Vassell's wrong about games kind of a lot. <laughs> I mean, like, <laughs> yeah, right, right. But he doesn't care. It's his opinion, so that's that's fine. Yeah, that's for sure. Game Boy Geek is, is always right on, though, I think. And Rado. He's my boy. Yeah, Undead Viking's my boy. He's my secret love. So that was our question that we just made up of who are the reviewers you guys love. <laughs> yeah, we're asking our own questions here. All right, what's what's your co-host's favorite role and move uh, game? This is a lot easier to answer the second time we record it. <laughs> yeah. So I'm going to say it's Merlin for Jason. Yep, and I think yours is that stupid horse game, uh, Home Stretch. You shut your mouth. <laughs> you shut your mouth when you talk to me. No, that game's amazing. <laughs> Uh yeah. It's a it's a very good role and move game for sure. Yeah. I haven't played it. I'm just giving you a hard time. Where does the music from the podcast come from? Um I skipped that one. But I didn't mean to. But I'm gonna just go ahead and give Jason a chance to have a shout out here. Uh Jason, our very talented boy here, he um made the music for this and a few other podcasts, I believe Jason, go ahead and read off your IMDB page for us. <laughs> yeah. I did the pot, uh, our theme song, the bumper music. I do bumpers for my videos and I did the intro for the, that's what she said videos. And I also did the theme song for board games outsider from JP. Who's on token punch, P- token punch lunch. He lives next to me and we're kind of buddies on Facebook. So I said, Hey, I wrote this. It sounds like your style. So here, take it. So, yeah, that's where it comes from. And you throw you throw in some wrenches. Yeah, I threw some wrenches and air tools over the top of it. Um, that's my contribution. Make noise while Jason makes something beautiful. It's kind of how the podcast works, too. Uh, my, my son actually did the music for my Cardboard Corner videos, too. So that's the only credit that goes not to Jason. So, um, yeah, cool. Uh, okay, we, if you were going to do a, po- a podcast about something other than board games, what would it be? Go ahead, Jason. Um, let's see. I, I gave a different answer last time, but I think I might 
Yeah, I probably got to stick with that. I'd probably do a podcast about music because that's what my other passion is, playing and listening to music. So it would be a, a podcast about interviewing musicians or just talking about my favorite CDs or albums, records, whatever, metal, 90s alternative, Christian rock, whatever. All things music, all things awesome. That's probably what my podcast would be. And you could call it Zayo and the Art of Meeple Maintenance. Oh, yeah. Zayo. Um, <laughs> that's a deep cut for those <laughs> only 90s Cornerstone boys will understand <laughs> yeah. that reference. If anybody knows who they are. <laughs> I would do, I've done a couple podcasts. I did one about movies, and we did an episode about Roadhouse, and um, we did an episode about Top Gun, and those are hidden somewhere out in the depths of the internet. They're actually both really funny, if you can find them. And then we did a video game podcast where we did around 50 episodes of that one. And then we made some unreleased uh, episodes about just like unexplained mysteries and paranormal stuff, which I think is really fun, but it kind of gets me wired and kind of makes me have weird thoughts in my brain. And then I get nightmares and can't sleep at night. And I'm not really even joking. So um, I don't know. It's just I get weird like that. I get too obsessed about stuff. But I, I don't know. What would I make one about? Well, I'll tell you this. So I think it'd be amazing to do a meditative breakfast cereal podcast, but somebody beat me to it. So... Um, if I didn't do a podcast about board games, it would be a bunch of bad ideas, probably. <laughs> bunch of bad ideas. Oh, yeah, that's funny. All right. Um, what were your initial impressions after playing Settlers of Catan the first time? It's a good game, man. I thought it was great. I liked it. Um, I thought, oh, cool. I think this is a neat game. What else is out there? I think I need to buy this one. And I bought it. I mean, I think the same reaction that most everyone has, right? Oh, yeah. I'm with you. Like, I played it and I loved it. I want, like, I think it went out like the next day or next week or something and bought that game because it was awesome. I'd never played any game like it before. You know, we were playing Pit and stuff like that, Uno, Skip Bow. And then I played Settlers of Catan. I was like, oh, man, this is a whole new world for me. And then I started singing Whole New World like I was Jasmine. Oh, yeah. And, yeah. I think we all do that. I mean, let's be honest. <laughs> yep. And and then, I mean, because we're so progressive, usually our wives sing the Aladdin part and we sing the Jasmine part. <laughs> oh, so. for sure. All, all day long. Uh, no, I, I really, I mean, it was, I bought it and then it was right into Ticket to Ride and then it was right into Power Grid and then it was right into, you know, an addiction that I needed to get Dr. Drew to come talk to me about. <laughs> the love doctor? Yeah, <laughs> celebrity rehab, man. Oh yeah, I forgot about that. <laughs> um, what is our favorite game mechanism, and which game implements it the best? I like body dexterity, um, and I think Twister does it best. Yeah, no game tops Twister at that. That's for sure. Uh, for real talk, though, um, boy, I think it's worker placement is my favorite mechanism period on it um and i'm i'm gonna drop a a real like doozy of an answer here because i played this game one time and i just love it too and it was really hard not to put it on my games i played list but brass is just so darn good um key flower i think is my favorite worker placement game right now because it's got just a really unique way that you place workers don't you like bid with them or something like that yeah you bid with them or you do work with them and there's kind of like a set uh, not a set thing. We get to like kind of outbid other people, but then also you're you get to match colors. And then if you win the rights to a tile, you get all the people who did the work there to go into your collection. It's it's pretty neat. Yeah, I need to play that. Um, my favorite game mechanism is probably dice placement or dice drafting. They kind of are similar, but I'm thinking like Grand Oster Hotel for dice drafting, where you take a die and you get to take the action. And I'm thinking like maybe Marco Polo for dice placement where you put the dice on the board and you get to take the action based on the power of your dice. So those are probably two of my favorite mechanisms that kind of go hand in hand. I like the game mechanism called Vida Lacerda because it's kind of his own mechanism. (laughs) Yeah. Four worker placement spots and then 12,000 decisions from each spot. I think we might have the, our, our favorite Vida Lacerda game might be the same, but I think our second one is different. I think we might might both have Kanban as number one. And then our, your number two, I'm pretty sure, is Galaris. My number two is Vinyas. 
Man, I think I thought Kanban was my favorite, but I think Vinos might actually be my favorite right now. Whoa, that's crazy. Yeah, I've played that one more, so I kind of get the nuances of it now. So, yeah, I think I'm Vinos all the way. Galaris is still so great too. Oh, I love Galaris. I, I love it. I was just curious what a copy of Galaris costs right now because I'm like kind of hurting to play it right now. And uh, there's some people in my local group that I think would really love it too. And I know you've got a copy and you're generous with your copy that you'd play it with me, but I mean, you make me wear the white gloves, but um, you do let me play it. So that's nice. But a copy of the gallerist right now costs $895 on Amazon. I was like, are you kidding? Is it out of that's print? Crazy. Yeah, I think so. Well, it kind of goes out of print from time to time. Weird. Yeah, so Jason, you could sell your copy for $894 <laughs> and then just wait a few months and buy like one copy plus a bunch of other things. I could. I'm not going to, but I could. If you could sell it for $894, you should. But I don't know that anyone pays that kind of price. Yeah. Well, yeah, I would agree. Then I could buy Preda Porter, the $200 version, and I wouldn't feel bad about it. Well, and then you could buy more white gloves for making me play galleries, right? <laughs> That's true. <laughs> uh, all right. So what game do we think Darth Vader would enjoy the most? Lupin Chewy. Ooh, that's a good one. Battling those f- stupid... What is that? Are those stormtroopers that you're knocking down? Yep, you're knocking the stormtroopers down. It's chickens in Lupin Louie, right? Yeah, let's make it Yeah, let's make it absurd here, because that's probably real. I mean, that's probably what he would really like, honestly. <laughs> yeah, I can see that. What do you think, Jason? Darth Vader. Um, I think... i got to shut my phone off, because I accidentally played a video. Um, good job. Uh, I think he would play Seikatsu. I can see him playing a little game with some birds. Yeah? Moving birds around, trying to match the colors of birds. You know, I, I think he would enjoy that. It would bring out his inner uh, his inner light side. I, I want to say he'd play an abstract. Yeah, that is. Like an, Onisama yeah, yeah. or something. I, I mean, like, I'm thinking you pretty much had an abstract, too, because I don't think you actually do any bird husbandry in that game but uh i don't know i mean he might be into like a war game or something but yeah i don't know that's a tough question i don't i i can't get into the mind space of darth vader because he's so complex like i think anakin would really like playing Takedo or something like that but darth vader boy that's hard to get into the mind space of <laughs> yeah <laughs> he'd probably play imperial assault or queen's gambit or something rebellion Oh, yeah, that's true. Then the Death Star just keeps coming back over and over and over, and he doesn't keep rebuilding it. He's like, I've got two Death Stars. Finally. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Yep. I do that enough on this podcast without trying, so I'm just going to not do that. Uh, Which property on a Monopoly board do you fear the most, Jason? Um... I think it's the yellows. The yellows always screw me over. I'm I'm with the greens. So we were there on that corner. Yeah. We uh if you don't hit one you're going to hit the other probably. Yep. Let's be let's okay, so let's okay, let's cut that out Jason. Let's do a very clever answer now. I think the one on the board at all because that game is so bad and I'm so cool for saying Monopoly is bad. <laughs> yeah. I played a lot of Monopoly, actually, which is surprising. Before I met Settlers of Catan, I played a lot of Monopoly. I don't, I don't hate I, it. Absolutely. I mean, like, if you, ha- if, you play it with, if you play it with some house rules where you can get some fat stacks of cash on free parking. Right, yeah. And then, and then if you play it with the auction mechanism in there, like, the game goes a lot quicker. And I don't know. I think it's probably a better version of the game if you play, like, hey, once someone gets this amount of money, the game's over. Because waiting for people to go bankrupt is just like watching them die slowly, and it it's sad and boring. But if you said, you know what, first person to you know like five thousand dollars or ten thousand dollars wins, that makes a much better game, and that's a totally playable game, I think. Yeah. But I don't know. It's not. It's not terrible. I used to play it where if you roll eleven, you can move up to eleven. You don't have to move eleven. Ooh. So you can kind of go wherever you want. That's a pretty sweet variant. Yeah. That, I mean, then if you need a, a certain yellow or a certain green, you can just go to that green if you have the spaces. and You don't have to worry about going to jail. You don't have to worry about, you know, hitting a utility or something. You can just go where you want. It makes it a little more enjoyable. We used to play where if you landed on go, you got $2 million. And it made the game really broken and hard to play. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> we really would do like I think four hundred bucks if you landed on Go. But yeah, yeah, I think I gave it there's extra some, hundred or something. There's some weird house rules for that game. All right, what IP would you design a board game for? That's fun because I thought we were done, but there's a whole other page here. Uh, what IP would you design a board game for? What would be featured in its mechanisms? Um, I'm trying to think. I think I said something stupid last time, so I would probably go with Major League. Have a sweet baseball game with Ricky Vaughn as the pitcher. I would do a. Oh boy. I would do like a full house game, but I'd make it real dark. Like it would have like that village. Um, like you're playing through lots of generations of people. Cthulhu. And you have to like <laughs> bury people in the like yard and like, yeah, it gets real dark and sad because Bob Saget eventually dies and then <laughs> Candace has to raise the family. And I don't know. It had, it had that village kind of feel to it. Um, I don't know, man. Uh, what licensed product would I, would I build one for? That's tough. Um, what do, I love the X-Files and I think that, the detective game that just came out that I've not got a review out yet of, but need to. Um, I think he'd make an awesome X Files game. Like the the way how that game plays and the mystery solving thing would be awesome with an X Files skin on it. Um, I think the X Files Legendary game is gonna be cool um, if it ever really gets proper distribution. But um, I don't know. I love the X Files. I think that they're doing a nice job with it. Um, I man, I can't think of another really big LP that I really love that. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. I think you did a good job with that one, Jason. I did a poor job. So let's do a thing where we give each other grades now. That'll be our new game to create. <laughs> and that gets a C minus <laughs> for me, A plus for you. <laughs> Jason, what's your grail game? Uh, it's Predator Porter for right now. Yeah. That's a pretty good one, man. Um, my grail game right now. Uh boy the game i want the most right now that i can't have uh, is dinosaur island the deluxe edition i really want to have that in my possession i think whenever i see that small world like three thousand dollar wooden chess game uh version of small world i always think it's really cool but i don't like that game that much um i don't know man it's tough um it's it's hard to say that there's a game that's just like hey i absolutely have to have that game and want it um and it's out of print and super rare because usually those games that are really good to me aren't going to be out of print that long so i want gallerist right now i guess it's kind of a grail for the moment but i got a feeling it'll get reprinted um i don't know tough one yeah uh yeah and i want the the fashion version of preda porter so maybe when the new one comes out if it's a different theme i can pick that one up for cheap yeah, I, man, they keep flirting with this, like saying Predator Porter's coming back, but we'll see, I guess. Ignacy's terrible about that, man. He takes forever to redo things. Well, like he had a tweet of the board design that was being done like eight months ago, so you'd think they'd have some news. Yeah. Maybe it'll just be a secret drop at Essen this year. I don't know. That'd be cool. That would be awesome. <laughs> uh, Nick, for a Merry Christmas for that boy. Yes, it would. Um, what is William Shatner's greatest role? Uh, the Priceline Negotiator. <laughs> oh, yeah. I forgot about that. <laughs> I think and you got to go Captain Kirk, right? Oh, yeah. That's my favorite for sure. Actually, no, I take that back. I saw him as Two-Face in this Batman cartoon. Ooh. That's pretty slick, too. Harvey Dent. Yep. Is that Two-Face's name? I, I, that's something from the deep recesses of my brain that I don't know how it's there. Yep, I'd agree. Very cool. All right, so the last question is, this is for little Rosie, the little meeple, and the question is, what is Rosie's ideal date? So, Katie, you can go ahead and answer that. Hi, everybody. It's Katie from Such Things As That's What She Said and a couple of videos with Jason. So, um, I wouldn't say Rosie's little, she is actually a rather large meeple. She's big boned, if you will. And I don't know if Picorni is trying to uh, set Rosie up on a date with some other supersized meeples or what. But, um, you know, Rosie likes uh, other minis. Um, you know, not necessarily the really aggressive war type minis. You know, she's not in for those 40K guys, but I think she likes uh, 
she would like um, someone to have an intelligent conversation, maybe a picnic, a nice stroll through the park, maybe some shipping on the Mediterranean or uh, with a nice point salad or something. I think that that might be something like her ideal date. It's a good date. I like it. <laughs> She's very Euro. <laughs> All right. So there we have it. We have... Rosie's ideal date. So this has been fun, I think, Jason, to answer these questions. Um, I hope that we get more questions in the future and we can do this again. And FAQs part two. Um, really enjoy that you guys care enough to ask questions. And I think some of the best questions are still out there. I just can't think of what they would be. Yeah, I mean, I'm sure if there are other questions, we'll hear about them once people hear the episode if we didn't answer everything that they thought should be answered, but... Who knows? We'll find out. And I guess the good news, too, is that the next like 30 or so episodes probably are going to come straight from your guys' ideas that you gave us on the Facebook page. Yeah, um, that's true. The only thing, I mean, I'm like not going to insult anybody because they don't listen to the podcast, obviously, if they did this. Like, people who put up topics that we've already done. It's like, thanks, bud. We did that one already. <laughs> I, I appreciate it. Good job. Yeah. Thanks for listening. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> But speaking of that, we do need to pick a winner of the topic for next week. So we'll probably be doing that, I don't know, sometime this week. And we'll shoot out a message to get your address if you're the winner. And you'll get some kind of surprise review game. Who knows what that is? We don't even know what that is. But stay tuned. And you'll find out when you get it. It could be a copy of my unnamed prototype. (laughs) Half rules done. (laughs) It could be. (laughs) Cool. Well, hey, guys, thanks for listening, and keep gaming. Anything else, Jason? Nope, you covered it. Well, I get to edit this 57 minutes of fun down to something listenable. It always happens in the magic stages of post-